Hello everybody, James here and it's Ask Dutch Anything, I think it's 25. Anyway, we're going to do the plugs very, very briefly. Uh, Dutch has a University of Dutch hat there. He's very, very limited edition. If you're interested in one, he will sign hey, it for you I on only, the top of the print. I only have, I only have 10. There you go. So we uh, he has diplomas, signed books for sale, and those very rare hats as well that he will sign all of them. And, <clears throat> excuse me, that camera's going crazy as well today. This one as well, but we'll leave it. Uh, anyway, this is the quick version of the plugs. If you want, uh, if you're interested, if you want them, if you want to buy them, Dirty Dutch Mantel with two L's at gmail.com. But the uh, relevant email to send your questions in to this show is questionsfordutch at gmail.com. All I'm doing is just looking at your camera to go absolutely crazy in the background. But anyway, questionsfordutch at gmail.com. It's just stopped. It was going, woo, 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 and then it's, and as soon as you started trying to move it, it stopped. There's no movement now. I know. You broke it. Now, I wonder why it stopped. I don't know. I don't know. This stupid camera, I tell you. Okay, I have a blue light on it and a green light on it. Mm -hmm. Now the green light is on and it's not moving. Hmm. Oh. The mysteries so of the, the universe. We'll, uh, yeah. anyway, uh, for the uh, especially for the audio listeners, that has to be one of the... A, a, yep. a fairly tedious exchange just listening to silence there so we shall move on and we shall ask your questions that you sent in questions for dutch at gmail.com and the very first one is from david maury or maury any fond memories of the mid-south coliseum and some of your best matches in that old closed forum i, I love the mid-south coliseum i really did because it was I always thought it was a 12,000 seater, but it's really not. It's like more like 11,000 something, but it was, it was right there on it. I guess if you packed them in there and standing room only, I probably seen, uh, 13,000 in there because it was, people were standing in the aisles and, but it had a great atmosphere in the mid South, especially if you had a, a pretty decent crowd because they bought wrestling. Wrestling has been a part of Memphis for, I don't know, forever since they've had TV. It's always had, uh, exposure in Memphis and they've had some great talent go through there. Of course, you know, the number one guy associated with, with the mid South Coliseum and Memphis was Jerry Lawler. And then, of course, you had your legendary guys like Handsome Jimmy, uh, Dirty Dutch, Bill Dundee, Jeff Jarrett, and it just and the the Honky Tonk Man started there. Jimmy Hart started there. Coco Ware started there. You know, a lot of guys got their start in Memphis and expanded. And actually, that's where I I learned the business more than anywhere else. Jerry Jarrett was the booker, and then Lawler was the booker, and I would watch them, how they would handle certain things, and if you paid attention, you could you could kind of learn how to do it, and booking is not so hard, it's the pacing of it, and if you pace it right, and lay it out right, and present it, it's it's a sell job. You're trying to sell this match. How do you sell it? And a little bit of uh, common sense helps. It, and that's all it is, is common sense. Two guys don't like each other, and they're going to fight out, and then you, you put a prize in the way. If the, the winner gets this, the winner, the loser has to do this. And it's it's simple. Uh, I know there's a lot of um, arenas that you've appeared in over the years and probably non so uh, uh, you, the Mid-South Coliseum. You've appeared so many times there. Where does it rank as far as like the acoustics? Because every arena is different. But as far as acoustics, yeah, as far as like the oh, resonance was, of the fan noise, how does it work for you? Oh, it was loud because of the way it went up. It had a domed top, and of course, when the crowd come up, it's not like an open air stadium. The sound has a place to go. It can go out and it can go forward and upwards and maybe downwards a little bit, but the sound at the mid south would it would go to the up to the ceiling and stop, and it was coming back down. It was oh, it would be sometimes 
not the loudest I've ever heard them, but probably in the top three. The loudest I ever heard was in uh, San Juan, Puerto Rico, when we were in the, I don't know the name of the Coliseum, but in Beethorn, it's where the stadium is. But they introduced Carlos Colon one night. Uh, me and my tag team partner, Frankie Lane, were getting ready to, to wrestle him and his partner. When they announced Carlos Colon, it's the loudest I've ever heard a crowd because it, it reached a peak of intensity and it's almost like my ears went, they looks like shut off and I could still hear them. But I think that was nature's way of keeping me from bursting an eardrum. <laughs> I mean, a, uh, a, an eardrum, an eardrum, an eardrum because they, they were loud. Never heard them any crowd that, that loud ever. I'll, uh, I'll get back onto the Mid-South Coliseum in a second. It's, it was at the Estadio San Juan del Bicentenario. I've really butchered that pronunciation. But that's the, <laughs> what? That's the football stadium <laughs> in San Juan, apparently. Forget that. Anyway, um, who, <laughs> uh, do you know what? In the Mid-South Coliseum, who drew the most, or who was the most reliable draw in that stadium apart from Lawler? Well, it, it had different eras. Uh, I mentioned Andy Kaufman when he would come there. He was only there three or four times, mm. but it was it was a, not every one was a sellout. But it was a, a very good house, a very good crowd of say nine or ten thousand. Uh, the Fabs, Steve Kern, Stan Lane, they drew big money. Dundee, he drew. Handsome Jimmy Valiant drew big time. Uh, and but most of the, the cards in Memphis were they were not centered on one match or one person, it was spread out. Me and Lawler sold it out twice because I had a, a deal with Lawler. I only worked with him during that period about. It was three times in three months. And it was the first time, because I was a I was a baby face, I was a good guy. It was the first time I've ever seen a crowd split with such emotion. They introduced me. Wow. Much, much more supportive than what I thought. Mm -hmm. Then they announced Lawler, which I thought the roof would come off. Well, his was pretty like similar to mine. So we kind of split it. So, and we had a great match. We only had three matches in three months. And why it didn't go longer, I don't know. But it, it, it was, uh, uh, and I enjoyed working with Lawler. He had great ideas. He had great execution. Uh, he was the type of guy that, didn't have any wasted movement. Everything meant something. And he never got in a hurry. You never saw a lawler rushing to do anything. He took his time. And that's why he never really got hurt taking bumps, because he took his time taking bumps, too. If you gave him a backdrop, he'd go, Ooh, boom. A lot of guys take backdrop, bam, bam. But they land all kinds of ways. But, but lawler protected himself, easy to work with, good interview people believed him and he lived in memphis and he didn't and it and what he did uh just just dawned on me about 10 years ago he lived in memphis so he cultivated that town and he got a lot of commercials he made a lot of money i bet they were several years there in the 80s he he may have made a million dollars with his commercials and all his endorsements and all that one very quick question, then we'll move on to the next one. How many tickets would the Mid South sell in the glory days? You know, let's say the early eighties, if Lawler was not on the card. Well, it's according to what was hot. It's like anything else. Would Would you get sellouts without Lawler? Oh yeah, yeah. With it, I mean, you would you would get the occasional sellout. Yeah, you could, but most of the sellouts were with Lawler on the card. 
and it was packed. It had the Fabs and the Hanson Jimmy and, you know, Bobby Eaton and Condry and Cornette and Jimmy Hart and me. And see, when you say those names, it looks like an all-star card. But that was every week because they knew us. Because we didn't have like 120 guys like AEW had. If you took that AEW show into Memphis right now, or even back then, you know what you'd draw? Crickets. They say, what the hell? Because nobody identified to me. Now we're back on AEW knock. Mm -hmm. But see, I don't think anybody identifies with some of those AEW wrestlers. They just can't identify with them. But a lot of people could identify with, with Memphis wrestling because – we didn't have guys from Boston coming down and being big heroes or guys from New York or guys from Chicago. We had Memphis guys, Nashville guys, Alabama guys, Mississippi guys, guys that they, people they could identify with. So, and that means a lot when you ask somebody to buy a ticket because if they feel like they know you. And to close up, uh, literally closed up, the Mid-South Coliseum closed in 2006. And it does say here, for basketball, the the capacity was 11,200. So, 11,000, it seems. Well, 11,200, but that's their, their floor. The floor space is open. Mm. It's got the basketball court. So, let's say it's about 12,000. You can probably You could probably easily put 500 chairs on the floor. So add 500 to 11,200, you got 11,700 seats you could sell. That's why I say it's close to 12,000. Next question. Cody or Cotty, I'm sorry, butchering names all over the show here. Hey, Dutch, I enjoy your podcast. My question is, what happened to tag teams? Went from having teams like the Legion of Doom, Steiner Brothers, Harlem Heat, etc. to now it's teams like Pretty Deadly and other, your favorite Pretty Deadly. And others, I just don't get it. When you watch wrestling, you want to look at the guy and say, yeah, he's a wrestler. I truly believe this guy could tear someone apart. The guys they have now just don't have that appeal and are not believable and looked as more of a joke. Oh, but we on the last episode, we were talking about Samoa Joe, so I think he books the trend and is old school in that sense. But yeah, for the most part, you don't get teams and you don't get wrestlers like you used to. Well... The wrestling business has changed, and I, I agree. I agree partially. Well, what's his name? You couldn't say his name? Cotty or Cotty. C-O-T-I. Cotty. Cotty. Okay. Cotty. Well, let me tell you something, Cotty. <laughs> if that is your real name. Uh, oh, wrestling has changed. See, when you look at the guys like pretty deadly, to me, they're like, I find them entertaining, but pretty deadly to kill your ratings too. <laughs> they, they don't look like wrestlers. They don't. Uh, and sometimes what you're looking to do on a creative team, you're looking to catch a lightning in a bottle, magic in a bottle. It's what you're looking to do. And you don't know what team is going to do what till you put them out there. So when Pretty Deadly goes out there, I think we'll see them split in about a year. They'll go their separate ways. I don't think they're going to draw any big ratings or anything like that. They're just there to fill up space, actually. And I think they work pretty good, and I think they're fairly entertaining. But selling a ticket, let me put it to you this way. If Pretty Deadly was in the main event of a local wrestling card in your town that presents wrestling, you know, regularly, would you go buy a ticket to see Pretty Deadly? No. But if Brock Lesnar was there, mm. you might go see Brock Lesnar, Triple H, you know, the bloodline. You'll go see those guys. What do you think about the Vince McMahon airport test? You've heard of it before. What you? is it? Let me see. Well, if somebody walks through an airport and yeah. turns heads, then they have a star quality. Yeah, that's right. That is true. Because stardom is not bestowed. It's not given. 
It's just there. And he's, he's right. When people walk through and people look at that guy and say, what the hell is he? Or what does he do? Of course, a lot of people with wrestlers, they know what you do. So there's a lot to being flamboyant. But if you're going to be flamboyant, you got to be flamboyant all the time. You can't be flamboyant on TV and all of a sudden walk through an airport with a pair, a pair of shorts on and, you know, like, you know, sports shoes. You just can't do that. You got to, you got to dress the part. Like I said, Randy Savage, when he walked through an airport, people noticed him. Like Andre walked through an airport, people noticed him because they had no, they had no choice. Ric Flair, that line bastard, when he walks through the airport, yeah, they'll notice him, that blonde hair. And hey, he was on, uh, they had a, a football game, a, a playoff game in Tampa here, uh, I think last Monday night. Yeah. And he was like uh, the guest host. I mean, he didn't call any play by play, but they interviewed him. They put him out there. He looked horrible. People wrote in, they said, what is wrong with him? They said, he looks like he's about ready to fall over. And he still has the energy. He still has the woo. But the people look at him and, you know, they wonder if he's just going to drop over in the next week or so. You know, I actually kind of, you know, he, he, he didn't look good. So, but he's still a star. He really is. When he says he's a star, he's a star. Think of him what you want. But, and he probably was one of the most recognizable wrestlers in the 70s and 80s that we've had. It's, so. it's, it's not a good ad advertisement for his energy drink. It was like, here he is, the spokesman of the energy drink. He looks yeah. like he's about to keel over. Yeah. <laughs> that is not funny. I cannot believe you laughed at hey, that. When I, really you, can't. When I you, can't believe you. When are you going to do the taste test? Do they sell it in is, do they sell it in shops in your area? No, I don't even know where it is. It's just woo, right? I'm yeah. gonna I'm gonna buy some. I'll send it to you. If if you can't I don't know if it's like available everywhere or you have to special order. I'm sure it, it is. He's he's doing it in uh, on AEW. He's advertising it. Mm. Woo the I'll, drink. I'll, I'll, I'll try it. They sell it here. I'll send it. I'll send some to you. Next question, Mark. How do I know you hadn't put something in there? Oh, I won't be sending it to you from my address. It'll be direct from the manufacturer. Oh, because they don't sell it here. So. Oh, I see. I see. Now, okay. Mark says, "How were or asks how were gay wrestlers treated back in the territory days? Did their fellow compatriots even care for the most part?" Oh, we beat the shit out of them. Them <laughs> little bad. Now you know, there's a lot of talk in the world about LGBTQL, you know, PR, TRY. Nobody cared. They would go to the ring, whether they were actually gay or not. Some guys just played gay wrestlers. But nobody cared except the fans. Because we had to work with them. So if a guy come in, and I'm sure we had... And I don't don't quote me on this, but I'm sure we had trans uh, trans wrestlers years before it became fashionable. Wrestling has always led led in a, a lot of stuff like that. We may have had a guy who wrestled as a woman, but yet nobody knew it. Not even the girls he was working with. So I, I don't know, but no, there was no, we, we had to work and people said, well, what about black wrestlers? We didn't give a shit. We were trying to make money with these people, whatever. And a lot of gay people, uh, you know, I've worked with, you know, Adrian Street wasn't gay, but he played a gay guy. Oh, he was great. He would work that crowd up because they actively believed that he was gay. The only thing that threw him off, and I always thought this was brilliant on Adrian's part, he had Miss Linda outside the ring. 
So wait a minute. Now you got this gay guy who doesn't like women, but yet he has a woman in his corner. Is he or isn't he? And he was probably the toughest one on the card. Because nobody give Adrian Street lip because he just take them in the ring and beat the shit out of them. But yeah, we uh we had to we had to work with gay people. We didn't care. Whatever they did on their off time, that was that was their business. As long as it didn't affect me or anything I do or anything anybody else did, nobody cared. That's how they were treated. They were treated just like everybody else, like shit. <laughs> Stop it. That's not funny. That's not funny. <laughs> I like that one. Just strong <laughs> I um I think maybe Pat mm-hmm. Patterson, who, you know, he always described himself as the first openly gay wrestler, which in fairness I loved it, loved him. Yeah. And um he always said it's like no one ever cared in the business no, even they, in the fifties because it, it's like running no. away from the it's like running away to the circus. Yes. You know what I mean? It's it's like all the misfits basically go into this business somehow. And everyone's accepting of everyone for the most part. Even Dick Murdoch was a KKK member supposedly, and he worked with black wrestlers all the time. Supposedly. And he really, and he really didn't give a shit. Now he could he have been a K, a KKK member? I guess because you know he would he would say a lot of racist stuff. But whether he believed that or not, I don't know. I don't think he believed it. Uh, he might say it, but. I mean, if people heard him today say that stuff, they said, oh, my God, you know, they they don't have to worry about canceling him because he died like 20 years ago. But he was a great guy, too, and a tough bastard. And nobody cared. He he did not. Seriously, I was was thinking about this the other day. Nobody cares if somebody's gay. I think in real life, nobody cares either unless you make an issue of it. And then you bring it to their attention, and then you then you may get some an opinion. Some, yeah, that's all it is, really. So if you want to, if you're a guy and you want to go with the guy, do it. More power to you. Just don't bother me with it. <laughs> do you, uh, you? You've mentioned this guy before, and we've never talked about it on the podcast, Cassandro, because it was oh yeah in Mexico. Yeah. There's yep. even like a division pretty much for the Exoticos because it was the yes, Rudos yes. and Exoticos. the... I forget what the baby face are called. You know, I didn't yeah. know this. And I asked one day, I said, now this was, I asked, I asked this at TNA because we were going to bring him in. I didn't, I just, I just thought he was, uh, <clears throat> I didn't know what he was, but he had a great gimmick. I mean, he gets over. He goes out there and he does this, you know. I, but I didn't know what exoticos were. But they're trans guys, I guess, or women. I don't know what they are. Or ambi- but they have, ambiguous. Gender ambiguous, should we say. Yeah, okay, they, they were that. But he drew a lot of money, and we could have drawn a lot of money with Cassandra. Because he had that. He had that star appeal about him. You know, he'd go in a ring and he'd paint his face up and he'd have his eyelashes and his hair and <laughs> and he had a he had a male body, but you know, he tried to to adapt to a female body. <laughs> but and people didn't hate him, he but he was entertaining. He was very entertaining. So and I think there's still a place. I mean, when you take humor out of everything, a lot of people take it the wrong way, and some of them may be in their right to take it the wrong way. But now, you know, you can't even do that because now you're you become a homophobe, or I don't know. It just it, it's beyond me. Yeah, there's a uh, social media. Another reason um, to quit it. Ray Mysterio Senior trained him apparently. Uh, along with a fellow called Victor O... I can't even read it. I haven't got my glasses. We're going to move on. Anyway, George Carl. My question is, Dutch, you've done everything in wrestling, but have but have you been a part owner in a company? Have you been a promoter? And if not, why not? Well, I have been a promoter, but not in a company. You know, I've, I've run... Let me, let me clarify this. I've ran uh, independent shows separately. And I ran it, ran them with offices. I used their talent. 
Uh, no, I never had a company. I never wanted a company because now if you got a company, you may have 15, 20 guys depending on you to go out and bust your ass and book these towns. And a lot's on a promoter. I know that, but I'd rather much rather run independent shows, promote a show separately because I'm going to run this show on September the 21st. So all my energy is directed toward Saturday night or Friday night, September the 21st. That's where my life starts and ends. And so if I go in there and I draw a thousand dollars, well, I lost my, I lost my butt. But if I go in there and I draw $10,000, well, I've had a, a good payday. So, and that's, I'd rather work one show than try to run a territory and a TV and keep everybody working and keep everybody paid and fed. I just rather do that. I, I just like those standalone shows, standalone shows. Have you ever been offered points in a promotion of note? No. Or like a, yeah, like part ownership? No. No. Okay, next. Because oh, they're sorry. too greedy. The bastards are too <laughs> greedy. And if I got offered points, every week I'd be sitting like this. I'd say, wait a minute. He said that house was white. 10,000, it looked more like 14,000 to me. But how would I know? Now I could go in there and I'd say, hey, I need to see the books. I need to see the receipts. I need to see the ticket stubs. I need to see this. Now, if you're starting it off like that, you're starting off with mistrust. And pretty soon that's not going to last long. And then they ask you to leave or really screw you. So, <laughs> so you're making less than anybody else because now their losses, they're taking it out of your money. Next question. Dave, a massive fan from Western Supermare in the UK. Hello, Dutch and James. My question is about managers. Do you think a manager benefits a single wrestler more or a tag team? And has the art of the manager gone and will it ever return to prominence? Thank you for all your hard work. Well, I remember managers felt out of, out of favor uh, especially in the WWE, uh, you didn't see managers for a while, and all of a sudden they made a resurgence. And yes, they can make a difference, but I, I think now they they may have overused them. You can overuse managers like anything else, but and a lot of times a manager is a guy that they put put with the team because they can't figure out what else to do with him. They'll just stick him out there and just so he can get paid and he adds zero. See, when I went to the ring with uh, the, the Blues, Ron and Don mm -hmm. Blue, the brothers, I didn't really do anything. I, I just did the interviews for her. When I went to, to the ring with uh, Justin Hawk Bradshaw, I didn't really do anything. I just did some talking and – I may have added a little bit to it. You took a lot of clotheslines. I took one from John, but I tell you what, easiest clothesline I ever took. Hmm. Because, listen, if a guy's coming at you as big as John Bradshaw and you don't have the state of mind to, you got to move with it. So when he's coming, I'm already going. So by the time he gets there, I'm already, I'm already gone. It looks like he took my head off. And John also has a habit of he likes you. It's like a lot in wrestling. If a guy likes you, he's not going to hit you hard. But if he doesn't like you, yeah, he's going to maybe lay it in there a little bit. But that's why I got along with everybody. And, you know, humor goes a long way in a dressing room. If you can make somebody laugh or feel good, you know, Hard to hate you after that. But anyway, yeah, uh, managers use right can, but I, I, but I like using wrestlers along the lines of Bobby Heenan because Heenan could have a match. Mm -hmm. Jimmy Hart is a hell of a manager because you can have a match with him. Cornette is a great talker. You won't have too good of a match with him, but he'll, he'll try. He'll bust his ass. Do you ever see uh, Cornette fall off that scaffold in Atlanta at Star Wars? Yeah, we, uh, Starcade. Uh, we watched it oh. on this show. 
man, I felt sorry for him that I, he couldn't walk for, uh, uh, for a while. Mm. He was, he was banged up. This sort of leads into this next question, actually. RG asks, are there any wrestlers that did not get along with their managers? Well, not long term, I don't think. You had to get along with them because they would separate you. But they were probably, yeah. See, some companies had their own managers. Let's take the old WWWF. They had their managers in-house. They had Lou, what was his name? The Albano. Big, Albano. Lou Albano, and they had that chic-looking guy. Mm -hmm. I forgot his name. He stayed there. I never saw him anywhere else. The Wizard. And I think the they had one. They had one more. Freddie Blassie. Yep. You saw, I only saw him. He, he came through Atlanta one time. He was over like a, a he had heat out the yin yang. Then he went to New York. Then he went to LA. So, but Freddie Blassie was a, he was a great manager and drew a lot of money in Georgia. He's a, he's a classic figure in Georgia wrestling years ago. The next question RG also asks which wrestlers were obnoxious when they were drunk? About all of them. <laughs> uh, I, I tell you who's a little, I'm not, and I love him to death, is, is Jeff. Jeff is, he's, he's going to be the life of the party, but he makes somebody, I mean, he don't give a crap. So he was, uh, I, I don't remember, Buddy Landell. He was, he was another one. Love him to death, too. But when they get drunk, man, they were just, they were too much. I'm, tr I'm trying to think because I didn't hang around with the guys who got drunk. I just didn't like that, you know. Mm. Uh, I never got drunk. I may have drank a beer, too, but I never really wanted to. If you get drunk, you're out of control. You can't defend yourself. You can't do nothing. may not even get the proper signal. Somebody could be shooting at you, and you wouldn't know it. So anyway, it's a it's a bad thing if you go out on the road and you, you want to get hammered a little bit and then you're not aware of everything that's going on. Uh, here, here was another one, I think, was uh, he was a football player. TNA used him one time. Black guy. God, I can't Is remember he his Pac name. Pac-Man Jones. Pac-Man Jones. Boy, don't get him hammered. Oh, my God. He, he was... But anyway, let me say this. The reason I don't know a lot of people who were buttholes when they got drunk is I stayed away from them because they're trouble. Mm -hmm. And the only reason I know Jeff is because I, I like him. He's like, he's like my brother, really. And I'd get around him, and boy, he'd have a hell of a time. But he could be a little trying sometimes. How would he wind you up? When he was, uh, when he didn't buy no, just, just fucking around, fucking with everybody. He just wasn't, he wasn't fucking me. He just fucked with everybody <laughs> and, and, and didn't give a shit, you know? And you tell him, ask him back the next day. He said, oh man, you know, whatever. He, he never even say anything about it, but he was, he was funny, but he was, he was relentless. Uh, I suppose because you didn't really hang around with hard drinkers in that sense, but do you know anyone who would, go out to a bar looking for a fight? Because obviously most wrestlers would just want to be insular, not be bothered, but there's no. got to be a couple who are just absolutely looking for a fight. The ones that look for a fight, they didn't last. Because you could damn sure get a fight in a bar. You were a wrestler. You could get it real quick. Because guys, they don't give a shit how tough you are. You go in there, you, you, know, you push around, and all of a sudden here's this damn... Big old hard nosed farmer redneck guy, and all of a sudden he knocked your lights out or hit you with the beer bottle. I'll tell you who was forget those other two I said. Uh God, what's his name? I managed him in WWE, the Spanish oh, guy. Alberto, yeah. Alberto del Rio. Brother, 
when he got drunk, when he got a little soused up, he was very, very, he was there. He was, he was on you. So, and I was, I was in a, I was in a bar and the only reason I was there is because the, 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 the motel, the hotel we were staying was right there. And the restaurant was right there. So I just went in there a second and Del Rio was in there and he was, he was drinking, had a lot of English guys around and he said something and English guy said something. And the next thing there was a beer bottle come right over his head. Bam. I saw him the next day. <laughs> he didn't get laid out of it, but his eye was all black. And I said, what happened? Oh, you know, you know, you know. Some of those English guys just hit him with a bottle upside the head. And, of course, they threw him out and threw Del Rio out. And he, I don't even think he went to the hospital. He just went back and put some ice on his eye and went, went and got on the bus the next day. <laughs> all in a day's work. No, oh, yeah, it is. Now, this next question, I'm very interested. Just while I'm asking it, bring your microphone a little closer to you. Um, Freddie <laughs> asks, <clears throat> have you ever seen or heard of the leaked email Vince Russo once sent to Dixie Carter trying to get Jim Cornette removed from TNA television? If so, do you think Russo had a point that TNA should have been going in a young, more hip direction rather than presenting the old school and uncalled Jim Cornette as a major character on the show. I've got the email here. Do you want me to read it or do you know? I've read it. I've read, read it. it. Okay, tell, yeah. us the, tell us the meat of the email. Well, he wrote it directly to Dixie Carter, didn't he? Yes. And he was saying the way that we should be going is with younger guys, which I kind of agree with him there, and not using, in his words, dinosaurs like Jim Cornette on the show. Now I can say that I don't totally disagree with him, but the reason he wrote this is because he didn't like Cornette and Cornette didn't like him. How they both appeared in the same company is a long story, but I think what had happened was, I got to think about this. Jeff come back in as like the head booker or the head of creative. And we initially got Cornette to be on creative. And, you know, Cornette hates to fly, hates it. So he was, he was driving from Louisville, Kentucky to Orlando, Florida, every two weeks. You know how long that is? It's about 1,000 miles, yeah, we 900 yeah. miles. Yeah, about, about 900, 900 miles, miles than we were. But yeah. he, hated, he hated to fly. So got down there, and, and, he, would, and he, would, he would stay for creative, too. Then he would, after that TV, we would go back to, to Nashville for two days. And we would book the next two TVs and the shows we had, and then he'd be off for 10 days. So I think if I, if I remember this right, I think either Jeff got to talking to Cornette or I, I forgot now, I can't remember but wanted him to to come in and see if he could help us because he has pretty good brain and it comes, it comes to the booking. So we brought him in and Vince Russo was gone. I think this was where when Dusty took over and then when Dusty took over, he got rid of Russo and then, uh, and then Dusty fell out with him. That went back to Jeff, which confused the talent. But anyway, we got Cornette in, and then all of a sudden, they wanted to bring in Russo. And I went, oh, my God, because I know how 
all oil, oil and water is going to react. So I went and told <laughs> Jimmy during the tapings, I said, Jimmy, I, I just want to give you a heads up that uh, I think <laughs> I think Vince is going to come back. And he looked at me, he went, what? I said, yeah, I think Vince is going to be here the next TV. And he says, okay, I quit. Mm -hmm. Just like that, I quit. And handed me his papers. I said, no, I don't want that. And he said, no, take them. I'm done. I'm not going to work with him. I'm not going to work. I said, come, Jimmy, stop. Quit being childish and quit doing this, quit doing that. So, and he gave me a, I, he may have took, I don't remember if I had his stuff or he took his stuff, but then I went and told Jeff, I said, Jeff, I told you, and it's not going to go over good with, with, with Jimmy. I, you, you might need to go talk to him. And he wouldn't talk to him. And they talked for like an hour, maybe more. And I guess Jimmy laid out the, his reasons for not wanting to work with Vince. And of course, Vince will lay out his reasons. He don't like to work with Cornet. They just don't like each other. So I guess <laughs> I guess Jeff, you know, he's a great salesman. He could sell a dying man a health club membership. That that's that's how good he is. And he got Cornette over to the side and talked to him and very he's very convincing. And he says, I let's do I don't want you to go. I need you. I need him. You and Dutch, and you know, we had a few more, Scott DeMore, and he said, We'll keep that together. But I guarantee you, you won't have anything that you have to work with Vince. So he he he, he got a promise from Jeff that you won't ever have to work with, with, with Vince again. So you can be in the same company, you can be in the same room. You just don't have to work with him and talk to him. Well, he accepted that. Because Jimmy blames Cornette for getting him fired from WWE, uh, WWF that time. So this would have been the second time that he's done it. So along Vince's line of thinking, you can't blame him. And really, if Jimmy has any ounce of truth in what he's saying, you can't blame Jimmy for not liking Vince because Vince got him fired. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that worked for a while. Well, to, uh, well let me read you the email because uh, – it's not like I completely disagree with the philosophy of it, but it's it's sort of who it's coming from as far as there's obvious you know obvious hatred between the two uh, people. But I'm going to read it to you, and you you tell me. Uh, the first bit of the email is he's talking to a friend, and he says the friend felt like we're sending out mixed messages, and the pieces don't seem to fit. Now this is October 2006. This email was sent. He said he saw one of Conan's group LAX that came across as cool, hip, and cutting edge. And moments later, he saw Jim Cornette on the same show that came across as a southern 1980s wrestling cartoon. Dixie, <laughs> these were his exact words. I agree wholeheartedly with this. And I tried to tiptoe around it with Jeff, and he got defensive and mad at me. Right now in Samoa Joe and Kurt, we have two wrestlers about as real as can be, the closest to UFC that you're going to get. Then on the other hand, you have Cornettes and your Jeffs, Jeff Jarrett's to some extent. They're about as old school wrestling as you can get. It seems that in 42 minutes, we have different brands, two different types of entertainment. My thing with Cornette isn't personal. I swear to you in big capital letters. But I'm just having a huge problem with him representing TNA management wearing a canary yellow sports jacket when we go to prime time. Again, Dixie being hip is the key. Joe is cool. Angle is cool. LAX, you have guys like Truth and Hoyt. Then we shot ourselves in the foot when we go back 20 years. Again, I just wanted to make note of this. To be honest, if I was writing TV, a character like Jim Cornette would not be representing TNA management. I'd rather go with an attractive, sexy female executive like a Tina Fey. Uh, or, or like me, because I'm looking like Tina Fey with these stupid glasses on. So, um, with Vince's critique there, he's Look, sounds to me like he's trying to edge out Jim Cornette and Jeff Jarrett out of his own company there to a point. But does he have a point in what he's saying? Well, he has a point, I guess. But Vince tried to overhaul the business. He wanted to present this to a certain uh, section of fans that we have found out later that are very fickle. 
They're not true fans. They'll be there for a year or two, and then they're gone. See, the old Southern style, the, the old brand, they're going to be there. They will be there through thick or thin. It could be the shits, but they'll stay with you. See, I didn't see a problem with, with Cornette because at least he knew what he was doing. He's talking about the young, hip female. We tried that, too. That don't work. Where are you going to find a young, hip female who wants to go out there and do that? The, the, they just don't fall out of trees every day finding that person. If you found one, yeah, it might work. But we didn't have one. Trying to make one, you might might be in worse shape than, than what you just got rid of. But that whole letter stems from Vince wanted it one way, his way, and I can't blame him for that either. But, and he was, what he was doing is he was, is instead of trying to work with the problem that he perceived as a problem, he tried just to get rid of the problem. But in the process, he created more problems. He created more problems for Dixie, more problems for Jeff, which more problems for me. See, let's see if we can get this ship sailing smoothly. Once you get it going smoothly, then, then go to work on your bubbles in the water out there, so to speak. Next question. MD says, the first barbed wire match I saw you were in, and there were only two strands of barbed wire. Can't remember if it was in Memphis or Louisville. Do you remember that? And was it hard to work with not having three strands? Thanks, Memphis Mark. Mark, that missing one strand of barbed wire messed me all up. I couldn't hardly concentrate <laughs> on the rest of the match, knowing that one strand of barbed wire was somehow missing off the ring. No, I don't remember that. Uh, but as far as fulfilling the the description of the match, you still had bar wear around the match. And even though you only had two strands, you know, people could see the, the two strands, but no, it, it didn't bother me. Bar bar matches to me, I didn't much like them because they're hard to work and they're dangerous, especially I, I'm, I'm, I'm nearsighted. I'm blind as a bat. So if I got close to that barbed wire, I would have to really, really watch. Plus, if your hands hit it at the wrong spot, you know, you could have all kind of holes in your hands, holes in your back. So I wasn't a fan of barbed wire matches, let me say that. How many did you have in your career? Well, I had one or two in Puerto Rico and, I don't know, three or four in Memphis. That's about it. Did I, we, I didn't. I, I didn't like them at all. How did uh, how did they lay out the barbed wire in different territories? They just wrapped it around the ring. Yeah. They would put it up. A lot of times they would put it up outside the ropes, but you were kind of protected by the ropes. You know, you go into the ropes, and you know you probably had that much room between the rope and the wire, so you had a little gill. Sometimes they took the whole ropes down and put new cables up and just wrapped it around around the cables, which is very, very dangerous. No uh, no terrible injuries to report then. Probably well, I got those. cut I got cut a few times on the hands and you know the shoulder and but what I worried most about that was the infection. You could get infection from that. You don't know where that barbed wire has been. It could lay in a barnyard for a year with all those cows walking around on it and chickens and no no telling what kind of bacteria was on it. So if you got <laughs> cut by it, it was, you know, you could get an infection. Yeah. Are, are, you, are you telling me that Jerry Jarrett wouldn't spring for a fresh spool of barbed wire? He just rolled oh, it from would. the farm. No, he would. What I'm saying, but you don't know sometimes. Yes. 
because they would have to take that between the towns. I don't know. This next question, I've got a feeling it's going to be a very quick one-word answer, but we'll see. Nelson Oliver asks, there was a match on TV, mind where this wrestler used a hammer to pull someone's ear off. This has tormented me throughout my life because I can't remember the names involved nor the storyline for it. If it, it wasn't WWF because this was a Saturday showing on Sunday, I believe Saturday. So, I never heard that. I never heard that at all. No. Uh, How do you take a pair of pliers and pull somebody's ear off? No, a hammer. Uh, or a hammer. How would you pull a hammer a ear off by a hammer? By the claw? Yeah, like a nail. He's... I, I, what's his name? Nelson. Nelson, I think you've had some vivid dreams. <laughs> but I never, I think that would make wrestling folklore. I would have to have some more backstory on that because I never heard it. Okay. I'm, I'm okay. Gonna, okay. I'm, Nelson, put yourself in the dressing room. Here's Russ, your wrestler B, and wrestler A comes up to you and says, Hey, B, I got a great idea. I got this hammer and I want to. Claw you on your ear and then pull your ear off. How's that sound? What would you do? You say, no, I'd rather keep my ear <laughs> <laughs> if I possibly could. <laughs> no, I never heard of it. Okay, I've I've got a possible theory. It may have been because if you're talking about WWF at the time, so let's say it's the early eighties or mid eighties or whatever, it may have been Southwest. Tully Blanchard versus Terry Funk, and I think they did some sort of ear thing with the ring bell hammer. So check that out. Maybe it was that. We're going to move on. We've got time for a couple more. We'll see how we get on. Mike asks, I was wondering what wrestlers and the refs talk about while the announcer introduced you. I always see you guys going over to the ref and shooting the shit. Are you going over the match? No, we're not going over the match and we're talking to the referee unless we want him to tell the our opponent something. No, a referee will walk over sometime. He said, hey, check out that blind behind you, whatever. <laughs> you know, there's some girl sitting out there. Watch, look at this. Look at this fat bastard over here. And, you know, you do his head and I'll look over there. And But, yeah, we're not, we're not discussing the match. That's already been discussed. Mm -hmm. And somebody said, how much do you go over a match in the back? Back in the older days, we didn't even go over the match. We just get to finish, go out there, and we would do what the crowd dictated. If they were buying this, we'd do that. If they were buying that, we'd do that. And then we'd just get some heat and go from there. I mean, I've worked with guys. We wouldn't even say nothing in the ring because we had done it so many times. It just, it, it just flowed like a river. I mean, I've worked out there 10 or 15 minutes and never really called anything because we knew what was coming up next. And that's when you you can really have good matches with with other talent then. Because when you're not when you're not asking and you know, you know your opponent and you know what they can do, they know what you can do. Okay, I'm going to ask two more questions because I've only got two more left, so we might as well round it off. Elliot, love the show, guys. Watch every day. Honky Tonk Man once memorably explained why he doesn't tip at restaurants. And then he threw that fat so-and-so, King Kong Bundy, that's a quote, fat, King Kong <laughs> Bundy under the bus for never tipping either. Do wrestlers often not tip and keep the money for themselves, or is Honky and Bundy just cheap? No, we're not. I don't think I've met wrestlers who were that cheap. Bundy, I've heard that he doesn't tip. Uh, probably Wayne is the greatest tipper in the world. But I've never been around wrestlers who didn't tip something. I mean, even when we were not making much money, we would still tip something just out of courtesy. So, but Wayne didn't tip a lot, and then he threw King Kong Bundy under the bus for not tipping at all. Mm-hmm. Sounds like him. Yeah. Is Honky, I don't know if he's a legend. I know we've talked about cheap wrestlers before, but well, let's stick with Honky. Is Wayne just a cheap dude all around? Well, he could, he probably, he could, be, he could be because of the way he broke in. He broke in. He was, he's Jerry Lawler's cousin. Hmm. And that's how he broke in. And then, of course, just because he's a cousin, don't mean he's going to get any preferential, uh, treatment when it comes to 
getting paid and he probably wasn't making any money. And when you're not making any money, you don't have any to spend. I mean, and I, I could see days that guys didn't make, they didn't make enough to cover expenses sometimes, but that was one week. And the other weeks you hope would, would cover up for that. But then the question is, why would you stay into something where you're not making any money? But then again, if you're not, if you're not a, a, a skilled, say, construction worker or an electrician or skilled at this or skilled at that, that brings up another question. If you're skilled in something else, why would you be in wrestling? Is what I'm saying. So, yeah, there were some wrestlers who, who, who didn't tip. Probably Cactus Jack. He's probably not the greatest tipper in the world, but he, he comes along with the territory. And the last one we're going to ask. Is... I left the tip one time. I wrote on the back of the, the bill, hmm. don't bet on the matches. That was a good tip. What you think? Okay, last question for the podcast. Big D from Tennessee in the days of kayfabe. How was it looked on in the business when Ox Baker was on the price is right? Did anyone think this monster heel should not have been on the show? No. Well, when he was on the show, I think it was it was after his run anyway. I think Ox had more or less, Ox had more or less retired from from the active ring work anyway. So yeah, he he wasn't looked at in a bad way. He was said, "Hey, you see Ox on Prices Right? I think he did pretty good. I saw I saw, I saw the show several times." I mean, I could, I, I suppose I could play, but I probably won't. But uh, I mean, wasn't he already in films by that point anyway? Maybe. I'm tr- I remember what? he did one film. I forgot what it was, and he was played something, some kind of killer. He's pretty good. Yeah. So this was in 1981. He was on The Price Is Right, but also when was Escape from New York with Kurt Russell? I think it was after that. Yeah. Hang on. Escape from New York. 1981. There you go. Same year. Okay. Okay. So pretty much he was uh, on the way out by that. When did Ox retire? I have no idea. Oh. Last time I saw Ox was probably in the in the eighties or early nineties, I think. We were at a convention together. Still the same guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, he had uh, weirdly a couple of matches in two thousand eight, but he retired proper in. From full time work, nineteen eighty seven. Yep, it's about right. There you go. I'm trying to think. Uh, when, when did Ox Baker pass away as well? At the age of eighteen, twenty fourteen. So there you go. Right. On that note, we are going to s- shut down this podcast. So if you want your question answered, or at least attempt to be answered, or have the opportunity to be asked to Dutch at least, you email questions for Dutch at gmail dot com. All those books behind Dutch, as you see, the Dutch Man Tell Cap, of which there are a limited edition of about 10. If you want them signed, go to Dirty Dutch Man Tell with two L's at gmail.com and also the diplomas and anything else you can think of. Try and get him to sign some of those like uh, WCW cards. He's got some of those. Make him an offer. He might sell you some of those as well. Uh, just for merchandise things as well, you said uh, there's still a bit of a backlog because you're still you're still recovering from the illness a little bit, and I am, I am. There's still a backlog, but folks, I'm getting them out. So just just be a little more patient, and you you you'll be happy you did because you're going to enjoy the books. Yeah. There we go. On that basis, and just before we say goodbye as well, we also are on Pro Wrestling Tees. The link should be in the description or wherever, or hopefully on the screen. Hopefully by the time this is out, at least. But for now, we're going to thank you for watching and we will catch you again on Friday. So Dutch, we the people. We the people.